Gaius Marius, who was the illegitimate son of Marius the Younger and grandson of the third founder of Rome, Gaius Marius, came from one of the Roman colonies settled by the legions of Gaius Marius, likely east of the Adriatic Sea. He was probably born following Gaius Marius and Marius the Younger's exile in 88 BC, as the father and son systematically visited these colonies for the purpose of raising military forces to retake the city of Rome from Lucius Cornelius Sulla, that blasphemous conservative who had marched on Rome. Although we do not know the exact birthplace of this illegitimate child of the young Bermarius, we do know he traveled throughout rural Italy, and specifically throughout the towns which sprung up where the legions of Gaius Marius had settled. Consequently, he was quickly adopted as their patroness or patron citizen. This same Marius then arrived in Rome in 45 BC, while Caesar, as dictator, was in Hispania, battling Titus Labienus and the sons of Pompeius Magnus. During his time in Rome, Marius wisely visited the many plebeian collegia, who enthusiastically greeted him as the grandson of the working man Gaius Marius. He also attempted to hire Marcus Tullius Cicero as his defender in a legal dispute for which we have no information. Cicero, who politically opposed Caesar at the time, declined to accept Marius's case, citing his familiar relationship to the dictator, whose aunt Julia was Marius's grandmother. Cicero, the father of the Republic, having publicly recognized the family connection between Caesar and Marius, had inadvertently presented Marius a golden opportunity. Marius turned next to the usefulness of Gaius Octavius. Because he'd heard of Caesar's having chosen Octavius to share the long ride from Hispania to Narbo, he knew Octavius had the dictator's ear. And so, Marius led a large group of city plebs to confront the young Octavius. In early September, on Janiculum Hill, Marius, surrounded by city plebs, as well as several women from Caesar's family, delivered a speech urging Gaius Octavius to recognize their mutual family connection without delay. But Octavius's mother, Atia Balbasisonia, as well as her younger sister, Atia Tertia, upon learning of the man's solicitation of the plebeian collegia, believed him an impostor. Despite vocal pressure from the plebs, as well as encouragement from his female relatives to recognize Gaius Marius as family, Gaius Octavius hesitated. In an early demonstration of the methodical thinking and tact which would define his later career, Octavius surveyed the situation. That Marius had addressed the matter by hand-picking influential groups to pressure him into a statement, rather than by a private visit, told Octavius everything he needed to know. In very polite terms, then, and humbly expressing deep regret that the matter was beyond his authority, Octavius explained that Caesar as both head of the family and head of the state had the final say, and that he, a member of the Octavii, had no jurisdiction to formally recognize anyone's lineage on behalf of the Julii family. Let him go then to Caesar and state his case, Octavius announced to the crowd. If Caesar accepts him, you can be overjoyed to follow his lead. But if Caesar does not accept him, you cannot override his decision. Although the city plebs applauded Octavius's politically correct statement, Gaius Marius was, understandably, not at all satisfied. Around the 12th or 13th of September, once Caesar arrived in Rome, the dictator opened up the gardens of his Tiber Island villa to the public in celebration of his victories over the sons of Pompeius Magnus. Gaius Marius, surrounded by an entourage rivaling that of Caesar's, placed himself in the colonnade next to the dictator, where he chatted and entertained his sycophants. After this incident, Caesar, who would have been informed by his niece, Attia, of Gaius Marius's actions, and his growing popularity with the plebeian collegia, warned Gaius Marius to pursue his destiny outside Italy's borders. By the end of September of the 45 BC year, Gaius Marius had withdrawn from Rome. However, despite the fact that Caesar had exiled Marius from the city, the dictator did not publicly label him an impostor. Following Caesar's funeral and the impassioned eulogy given by the consul Marcus Antonius, Rome was divided, making Antonius the recipient of criticism from both sides. For seeking and gaining the immediate support of the city plebeians, whose rioting had led to destruction and many deaths, 
the conservative half of the Senate accused Antonius of breaking the March 17th agreement by inciting an insurrection. Yet, for blocking all senatorial motions to offer Caesar divine status, and for having made a pact with Caesar's assassins in the first place, Antonius's support from the plebs was wavering. Caesar's worshippers wanted vengeance, and Caesar's opposition wanted balance returned to the state. To make matters worse, Gaius Marius returned to Rome following Caesar's funeral. Quickly gathering the city plebs who had initially supported him, Marius took it upon himself to build an altar to Caesar on the very spot where the Roman people had cremated his body. Regardless of the Senate's wish to eternally debate, or the opinions of Marcus Antonius, the people could now come and offer sacrifices and votives to the divine Julius Caesar. In addition to constructing an altar in the Forum Romanum, Gaius Marius further aligned himself with the sentiments of the people by calling for vengeance against Caesar's assassins, Marcus Junius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus being the only two remaining in Rome. With such vitriolic speech, Gaius Marius quickly drew even larger crowds to his cause, engendering a cry for the heads of Brutus and Cassius. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, sharing the conviction of the crowds, was in favor of punishing Caesar's assassins and urged Marcus Antonius to choose the will of the people over that of the Senate, as Caesar would have done. But Marcus Antonius had plans of his own. Having learned from Caesar how easily Rome could be controlled from Gaul, Antonius wanted to exchange his proconsulship in Macedonia, which would begin in 43 BC, for a proconsulship in Cisalpine Gaul, which was currently governed by Decimus Junius Brutus. To convince the Senate to strip Brutus of the governorship appointed to him by Caesar, Marcus Antonius would need enough support to form a majority. In an effort to placate Lepidus and give him reason to keep his legion under control, while also maintaining unification within the Caesarian party, Antonius betrothed Antonia, his daughter by his first wife, to Lepidus's eponymously named son. Additionally, we are told that Antonius obtained the office of Pontifex Maximus for Lepidus, though by law the position was bequeathed to Caesar's heir. But Caesar's heir was only a child, and he was not in Rome. And Rome could not do without a Pontifex Maximus. To appease the conservatives, Antonius introduced the Lex Antonia, which completely abolished the dictatorship. Although the dictatorship had been originally abolished after the Second Punic War, and replaced with the Senatus Consultum Altonum, that law had been nullified for the sake of electing Lucius Cornelius Sulla to the dictatorship. Antonius argued that the office of the dictator had become indistinguishable from that of king, as evidenced by both Sulla and Caesar. And though the Senate approved of the Lex Antonia, they were afraid of the rabble-rousers amassing around Gaius Marius. It was only a matter of time before Marius let loose his gang of plebs to hunt down both Brutus and Cassius. And then what? Would that satisfy their bloodlust, or would they then go after those senators who had supported pardoning the assassins? Supporting legislation that allowed Cassius and Brutus to legally leave the city limits despite the restrictions of their praetorships, Marcus Antonius then turned his attention to Gaius Marius. Antonius relied on the support of the city plebs, a power base which he had inherited from his wife Fulvia, and which he now found himself splitting with Gaius Marius. Giving no warning, and using his consular authority, Marcus Antonius took Gaius Marius into custody sometime between the 12th and 14th of April. Without benefit of a trial, which was the right of every Roman citizen, Gaius Marius, the self-proclaimed grandson of Rome's third founder, was hurled to his death from atop the Tarpeian Rock. Although the Senate was shocked by Antonius's brutality and violation of the law, none questioned the decision, finding Antonius's actions prudent, given Gaius Marius's threat to Roman stability. But in aligning himself with the Senate, Marcus Antonius had lost the support of the city plebs, who had held him in the highest esteem. The supporters of Gaius Marius then poured into the Forum Romanum en masse, demanding the magistrates dedicate the altar Marius had built so that the people could make offerings to Caesar. They pointed out that Caesar was already being erased from history, as evidenced by the empty plinths which only recently had borne statues of his likeness. 
When they learned of the location where Caesar's statues were being smashed, the plebs invaded the shop and set it on fire. Marcus Antonius responded by arresting a large number of the agitators. Slaves were hung, and as with Marius, freedmen were flung from the Tarpeian rock. In ridding Rome of Gaius Marius, widely rumored to have been a runaway slave and impostor, Marcus Antonius was finally able to win the support of the Senate. Unfortunately, it had cost him the total loss of his plebeian support base, who now cursed the name of Marcus Antonius.